Snapchat. Please like and subscribe. Let's go. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Jason with Wolf Overland. And today we are doing the Goat Trail, which is in North Carolina, right off I-40. And depending on which way you run the trail, this is either the start or the end of it. But for most people, it will be the end of the trail uh, because you'll probably take 40 to get here and that's where I'll end up at the end of this video. We are starting off with this creek crossing, but right before this creek crossing, there's a really nice campsite that is one of our favorites. Got to put it into four, four low. <laughs> Noob struggled a little bit going up that water crossing. But right after you cross the, uh, the little uh, creek crossing there, you got a little bit of an easy hill climb. And we'll get up to you to the next obstacle. So the goat trail is also called Old Buzzard Roost, depends on who you're talking to. But Trails Off-Road rates this trail as a 3 out of 10, and it takes about an hour to do. Uh, it's open year-round, and any stock four-wheel drive vehicle should have no issues with this trail. This elevation is at 2,903 feet and you'll climb about 900 feet in total elevation. So the mud is still frozen from last night. So it's really crunchy walking through it. And some of the rocks have ice. Ask me how I know. But it's pretty out here. We got a winter, we're in a winter warning advisory right now up here. Because tonight and tomorrow, they're supposed to get three to six inches of snow. Um, I wish I could stay another night. But I can get back to work tomorrow. I already had two nights out here. You'll see plenty of awesome mountain views, especially in the spring and winter months where there's no dense vegetation. You can make it into a really fun trail by incorporating a Hurricane Creek trailhead with this as well. And there's also a third trail you could tie into it called the Old Mine Road. So here we are, still on the goat trail, and you got awesome uh, views going up, especially here in the uh, fall or winter months where there's no tree canopy. So that's the time to come when uh, there's no tree canopy up here, or when the leaves are changing, but you get better views this time of year with no leaves on the trees. 
uh, again, this is an easy trail. Any stock four-wheel drive uh, vehicle, you know, Tacoma, Jeep, stock, no problems with this trail. Trick is just air your tires down to 15, 20 PSI. It'll ride a lot nicer and you'll get a little bit better traction on some of these uh, uh, slick rocks. But definitely could be done in, you know, one to two hours, about two hours. Really fun uh, day trail. It was at this point I noticed the little uh, stream of water running down the trail and all the ice in the rocks. This part of the trail has water running down it. And as you can see, it's still icy and I'm slipping. So my problem is, is that these rocks are slick with ice we're gonna set the camera up. So there is an easier line to the um, to the uh, driver's side. I was just showing off, and those uh, rocks are covered in ice. So it's typically not that hard, you guys. I had to put on the rear locker to get up that because I was sliding everywhere. So we're almost to the top of the hill, or the top of the mountain pass, and the views are getting better and better. But uh, we still have. I mean, that's a that's a pretty steep climb still but just take it nice and slow it's a little bit icy today it's still frozen but we shouldn't have a problem with this Coming up around this corner, we have the only really hard obstacle on this trail. This is probably the hardest obstacle on the trail, guys. And as you can see, there's still ice in this. This mud hole is pretty deep and your best bet is to just get in it. I mean, you can see where people scrape. Um, again, your best bet is to go in it. It's not that deep, it's a solid bottom. But um, I wouldn't want to straddle that, because I can't see. I've gone through it before, and uh, I saw a stock F250 uh, go through it, so.
Yeah, so it looks scary, but it's got a rock solid bottom. And uh, I didn't have any problems with it. No lockers or anything. If you're coming the other way, you just need a little bit of momentum to get up that, that incline. This is a four-way intersection from what it looks like. So we're coming out of that way right there, which, you know, is the buzzard's roost slash... Actually, this is technically the start of the goat trail. But if you turn left, um, that goes to buzzard's roost and I-40, which is the way that we're going. Um, if you go right um, down this road, uh, that leads a nice trail down to a gas station right by I-40 as well, but that's about two hours, but it's all forest service flat road like this. Uh, very fun. Now the fourth intersection, in, yeah. Now the fourth intersection is right here and it's a little fork off here and goes up to where that sun is there. And you go up there, it's a there and back. It goes up to a cell phone tower on top of the mountain. Um, right now you'll probably have a good overlook of I-40 down below but um, there's nothing technical or crazy stupid. It's just, you know, a couple switchbacks up to a cell phone tower. Um, but we're going out this way, the buzzer's juice slash I-40. Um, so if you're coming from I-40, you're gonna to wanna to hang a right, right here. And this is, I believe the first right um, past the actual buzzer's juice overlook. But you'll see the fork on the left if you're coming from that way too um, for the, uh, cell tower overlook just so you guys can kind of see so we came up this way from buzzard's roost and then there's that fork that goes up to the uh it goes up to the cell phone tower ignore that part and then this one leads all the way back to gas station by i-40 as well but it's a longer one and this leads to buzzard's roost and i'll show you guys this i don't know if i'm gonna walk down to it but i'll show you where the overlook is and again, this intersection here is where you probably want to air down and put it in four low when you're headed down the goat trail. Um, because from here all the way to Buzzard's Roost down to I-40 is just all flat um, gravel for service road. So you don't need four low or four wheel drive for it. Just watch your speed around some of these corners too because people have flown off, people have misjudged these corners and have gone off. Um, I've seen it numerous times in the last couple of years and I've also seen people crash because they're going too quick around these corners. Coming back down the buzzard's roost side, there's a couple of uh, campsites. Um, they're kind of small and just little pull-offs off the main gravel road where you can even get any kind of two-wheel drive sedan up here off 40. Um, but yeah, here's one of them. But uh, yeah, there's a couple of these if you're in a pinch and need somewhere to camp, but just be aware, um, it's right off I-40, probably 15 minutes off I-40, and you can get a car up here, so. I'll put the GPX coordinates um, below, but um, here, let me show you guys. This is the Buzzard's Roost Overlook. Now, if you have young kids, be very careful because this is a very dangerous cliff and uh, it's, it's, it's a long way down. But when you're driving along this gravel road, if you're coming from 40 and driving along, there's a little pull out right here and you'll see a tree with a bunch of graffiti on it on the right side if you're coming from I-40. So there's a bunch of graffiti here and a little pull off and there's people down there right now. I'll, so I'm gonna, you know, let them enjoy it. It's a beautiful overlook. Um, you can go down there and just sit and watch the highway below. I know, see, you see the highway already down there. That's the highway way down there, about 2,000 feet maybe. But pretty overlook. You're not going to see these mountains in the uh, spring and summer. It's all dense foliage. But I'll cut in right here with um, earlier this year. I went down there with uh, uh, Justin. We walked down there. So I'll post a video of that on here. And uh, yeah.
let's uh, keep on going. So we're gonna be on gravel for a little bit. So if you're coming from I-40 doing this trail, you're gonna be on gravel for a while. So just heads up with that. So the only downside, if you're coming by car, um, is this bridge up here. If, um, if the water's high, you're gonna have issues. But it's basically like an overflow bridge, but the water, it ran a good last couple of days and it's not as high as it is. This is the end up here. This is I 40. So we're gonna pull off right here to air up the towers and then jump on 40 and go home. This is Cold Springs Creek exit off of I 40. Uh, yeah, Cold Springs exit. That's, but um, I put the link in the description. All right, that's the end of the trail. We are airing up, only to find out <laughs> the ARB dual compressor, only one of the compressors is running. So we got some electrical or a rebuild kit coming for that. We're gonna have to check that out. When I started it up, it wasn't like as deep of a noise. So I, you know, put your hand over the air intake and one of the compressors isn't turning on. So hopefully it's just a loose connector or something. Worst case scenario, we're gonna have to order a rebuild kit, which will be a cool video regardless. I've got my monies out of them. I mean, it's I, probably four years now running them. We started with the Tundra with that. So right now we're only running a single compressor, but it's doing its job. I'm just doing each tire individually. So we're gonna air up this last tire and then we're on the way. As I was sitting here airing up, we, I had uh, two uh, subscribers stop by and uh, say hi. They were on their way. To Hurricane Creek and they said the Harmon Dent exit was all closed and blocked off so they're asking about Chad Road and all that and headed up that way so it's weird seeing subscribers already um, on the trail so so that's the end of it please like and subscribe hit the notification uh, bell and we'll see you on the next episode thanks guys pardon the hair <laughs> um, we just got back from uh, our trip up to uh, North Carolina to run some trails and normally when I get back today's a Sunday so obviously the shop's closed um, but when I like to get back I like to put her up on the lift and assess any damage underneath because we did have to wench you know over a part where we just dragged the whole underbody so we're gonna make sure nothing got damaged um, and the uh, um, branch deflectors it's not working out. They worked out great for the Tundra because the Tundra was super wide and the way the bull bar was set up with the front runner roof rack that was uh, drilled into the roof, you can really torque these things down and they wouldn't move. Um, these kept loosening up. They, did, they really didn't serve a function because the Jeep, you know, the Jeep's not a really wide vehicle. So uh, we're gonna remove them. Um, it does kind of look cool, but they looked way better on the uh, Toyota and they're more functional on the full size. So uh, like, like most things on the Jeep, I prefer um, things to be functional over how it looks. So, you know, having the roof rack up there allowed me to move the, uh, the shower awning over and let me put some recovery stuff um, up there, which we use this trip to access recovery equipment quick to pull winch lines. So, uh, functional stuff like that, I, I'd rather have. So uh, we're gonna pull those off and then we're gonna put her up on the uh, alignment rack real quick, just cause it's easier to rack up than trying to set the rack on these other lifts. And we're just gonna check that stuff really quick. And um, I got a rattle above the speaker bar from where I pulled out the uh, XM antenna. So I, I think I don't have that plastic in there all the way. So it's been driving me nuts on the way back. Other than that, let's hope no damage. On another note, this gap in between the rack and here, 
uh, no, nothing touched. So even when fully flexing out, I didn't have any contact with that. The rack did shift forward about um, an inch and this is the third one where the rivet came out. And I'm very careful when I torque these down because this is what stops the rack from sliding back and forth. And uh, it's like, you have to have them tight, but you over tighten them and they, they snap off. Or if they're, you know, to the spec of what they had in there, I forgot what the spec was, but I have an, uh, a, an inch uh, torque wrench. You torque them down to that and the rack ends up moving. Now I weighed what I have on the rack. It is under, way under what they recommend um, as a dynamic range. So I don't know. I don't recommend trail racks, I'll tell you that. For those of you actually, you know, go overlanding off-roading, go with front runner or better yet, um, the best one I've uh, put together is the Rhino Rack. And I like Rhino Rack right now more than uh, front runner. All right, let's see what we got. Looks good. Oil pan, trans pan looks good. No damage to the axle. So it looks like this is the part that we winched over. So we kind of dragged on that. No fuel leak. Nothing to bind it up. That all still looks good. Going down. Everything else looks good. It's supposed to be up there. Or, no, those are bumped. Those are stops. And then the rear end. Looks like we didn't bend any sway bar links this time, which is a good thing. All right, we're good. Let's, uh, let's get to the house and unpack. There's the problem, blown fuse. It's a 40 amp. So it blew the 40 amp fuse. That's a 30 spare I have, but it's for that compressor. So I'm thinking the intake got covered and it blew the fuse. I put a fuse in, tested the resistance of the, that circuit. Everything's fine. Obviously I haven't tested it when it's hot, like if it heats up, but the other day when I noticed it wasn't working, it was when I first started it cold. So I don't know. I wanna replace the fuse and uh, keep checking it, I guess. Um, so we're gonna get replacement in there. Again, these are the original fuses from four years now. So they uh, definitely well used.